guys, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to be saying goodbye to my TRL Deals M3 Competition X-Drive. I've had this car for 10 months and covered eight and a half thousand miles during that time. Before we start this video, I'd like to politely ask you to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon if you haven't already. My absolute standout or highlight of owning this M3 was taking it down to the Alps and Monaco last July. That trip was about a week long and it gave me an opportunity to really push this car for the first time because over here in the UK, you really can't do that on the public roads anymore. Number one, because you'll probably end up losing your license and number two, because they're just too congested. Whereas the minute you get out to the Alps or the Pyrenees or somewhere like that, National Park in Portugal where I took the 911 Touring, well, you've got loads of space to play with. You've got perfect tarmac and you've got basically nobody around you. So it's a really nice opportunity to have a bit of fun in your car. Obviously you've got track days, etc., over here, which I do a lot of, but last year I was focusing mostly on my M2. Let's have a quick look around the car and see what I've changed in the time that I've had it and then we'll jump inside, talk a little bit about the interior and take it out for one last drive. Well, one last drive for the camera anyway, because for the next couple of weeks, I'll be putting it back to stock and then eventually handing it over to Tony and uh, picking up my M3 Touring. Let's start with aesthetics and styling. Now the G80 has really grown on me. I did quite like it when I first saw one in the flesh the back end of 2020 and then I liked them more when I saw them on the roads at the beginning of 2021 and obviously have grown to love them more during my sort of two years of ownership. I really like the Dravic grey on this car hence me going for the same colour on my Touring and I've gone for the carbon exterior pack and interior pack on this car just like I did on my rear wheel drive Portimao blue one. But on top of the standard equipment, I've also done a few little small and subtle changes. Around the front end, well, we have this lovely carbon fiber splitter, and that was supplied by my friends at Auto ID, and it's made by Sturken. When we get around the side of the car, we're running 10 mil spacers all round, plus extended wheel bolts, and we're running 15 mil lower eyeback springs on the front axle. Now those spaces and springs were supplied by my good friends at Motec Performance. And although 10 mil spaces and 15 mil lowering doesn't sound like much, I really believe that it's a subtle but good enough change for the standard setup car. And all those are being transferred straight over to my Touring once I have it, because I think they make the car look so much better but yet yeah, it doesn't look too far from the OEM car, if that makes sense. What is missing are my beautiful Edelweiss wheels. A few of you have picked up on that on my Instagram account uh, and in previous recent videos with this car. There is a full story coming about them soon. One of the massive potholes near where I live had managed to take out two wheels and two tires in one hit and I'm in the process of fighting that with my council. So the wheels will make a return on the Touring, uh, but for now, they're just feeling a bit sorry for themselves, broken <laughs> in my storage unit. I have got replacements uh, that have been sent out, but I'm gonna wait until I sort of get my Touring and the weather gets a bit better, and I can appreciate those wheels once again um, at some point later this year. Now we're around the back of the car, and I believe where you're looking is this car's best aesthetic angle. Something I always forget to talk about are these little carbon fiber uh, mud flaps. They're also supplied by Motec Performance, and they do a fantastic job because they're very subtle, unlike many mud flaps, but they also do a great job of stopping stones, especially from the front wheels, flying down the side of the car, hitting the doors or the extended rear wheel arches. So although aesthetically they almost improve the looks of this car, um, they certainly do a really good job in terms of practicality and prevent uh, extensive stone chips down the side of your car. Talking about stone chips, obviously I also had this car 
uh, PPF around the front end, the track pack, I believe it was called, from Berkeley detailers, and they ceramic coated the entire car when it was brand new, which in turn has definitely helped preserve the paintwork. In fact, it looks fantastic when it's clean. It was cleaned the other day. The guys at the Ish Museum got it very nicely detailed and the paintwork, etc., looks absolutely perfect. The front end is lovely because it's all wrapped. Um, so there's no stone chips, etc. And the Dravet Grey in general seems to have fared very well, certainly much better than let's say if it was black. And in terms of performance upgrades, well, as we're around the back, we might as well start with the Miltec exhaust system. It's a full system, and I've actually got a prototype titanium rear box on here that they put on for the Goodwood Festival of Speed because this car was on their stand, which was pretty cool. And underneath the bonnet, well, we have one of Eventuri's beautiful carbon intakes. I've run Eventuri's for about the past three and a half years. I've got one on my M2 competition, and it's been great having one in this car. Not only do they improve the performance of the car, especially the initial pickup, but they also look like a million dollars, and they really are made so beautifully well and worth every penny. To complement the Eventuri intake, I have a Hexon engine brace because the standard braces in these cars, although probably do a very good job in terms of strengthening, they just look a little bit ordinary. And this Hexon carbon brace looks fantastic and hops back a little bit to the standard brace that used to come in the F80 M3 or cars like my F87 M2 competition. Jumping inside, well, the most obvious, and in fact, one of the first upgrades I did with this car was take it to Royal Steering Wheels in Aylesbury, and Jack worked his magic, putting some beautiful Alcantara with uh, blue and red M stitching, and a Fiona red strip or stripe at the top. It feels lovely, it looks fantastic, and elevates this interior even more, but otherwise, it's just a lovely cabin and place to spend time in. I went for the carbon buckets just like I did with my rear wheel drive car and in fact that is the most common question that I get asked about the M3, the M4 and the incoming M2. Should I go for the carbon buckets? And it's a really difficult one to answer outright because I think the standard M seats are really good if you're using your M2, M3, M4 as your absolute daily car. You're jumping in and out of it several times a day. In that scenario, the regular seats do a very good job. They're fairly supportive as well and obviously very comfortable. But these carbon buckets are just so good and I know I bang on about them a lot, but there is a reason that I do that and that's because they are just so comfortable and so supportive and so adjustable. They do everything and these are heated as well. So. I really can't complain having these. Yes, they are trickier to get in and out of, especially for a lankier frame like me. Um, you know, you've got to squeeze in between the wheel and the top of the side bolster here. And as a result, well, these side bolsters on the driver's side, they show a bit of wear in eight and a half thousand miles, just like my rear wheel drive one did, but nothing too substantial. But a side note on that, these are the individual Fiona red version. So instead of Alcantara on the side bolsters up here, they're leather, which look nice, but don't quite give you as much support as the non-full individual seats. So like the Kailami orange ones I had in the rear wheel drive. And also the leather is a bit more precious than the Alcantara. And these jeans, like so many jeans, have metal rivets around the back pockets and the side pockets. And if I get in and out of this car in a clumsy fashion, then I tend to catch it on the side bolster and it's making lots of little scratches. They almost look like rips on the leather. Thankfully, they're not full blown rips, but they are marks. The last thing to talk about really is the fact that, well, my Touring is going to have the all new curved display in it and I drive eight. So I'll be stepping away from this current setup that I really do like, something I'm not massively fond of is the instrument cluster um, that's been around what for four or five years now bmw and i i just don't think it's that special so i will certainly enjoy the new curved display instrument cluster 
And in terms of the all touchscreen climate control and stuff, well, I'm not looking forward to that, but it will be interesting to see how I get on with the new iDrive 8 um, as an owner, essentially, and someone who can spend a lot of time with it and get my head around some of the features that I'm not too familiar with as it stands at the moment. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to get my hands on a lot of new cars and in fact both of my GATM 3s have failed to turn one in the time that I've had them. The blue rear wheel drive went back literally days before its first birthday and this car is going to go back to Tony just after it's 10 months old and although that sounds very lucky and fortunate, which it is, the issue with it is these cars start to run at their best once they are at least a year old and once they've done more importantly eight to ten thousand miles like this car has the reason i say that is the whole car starts to loosen up a bit and in a good way not in a bad way the engine in particular runs so much better and freer gives you more efficiency it revs better it also sounds better even if you've got the stock exhaust there is a downside to swapping out of cars very regularly um, and that's maybe why I really like my M2 because I really think that that car is running better and better aside again from all the upgrades I've had at Swift Performance it does run better today engine wise especially than it did when it was brand new three or so years ago In terms of performance, well, hopefully many of you already know that this car is an absolute rocket ship. I've actually timed it a couple of times using my Racebox Mini on camera to 60 miles an hour in 2.99 seconds. In fact, here's a little clip of that happening when I compared this very car to Audi's RS4. Here we go, active. Getting a little bit of slip off the line. 2.99 seconds, boom. You don't need your road car to be any faster than that. And the G80 doesn't stop there either. It has handling to match its straight line performance. And actually its handling is arguably better than its straight line performance. The front axle on these M3s and the G82 M4 is just unreal. I remember the first time I experienced it on the road and on the track and it never grows old. It's just so planted, has so much grip. This is running Michelin's Pilot Sport 4S, the star marked homologated BMW version. Um, and they actually came on this car from the factory you might get the short straw and get the Pirellis which aren't a bad tyre but there's certainly no match for the PS4S at this time of year in the UK and when you match those tyres up to this chassis and this handling it's just unreal in fact we're coming up to a really cool bit of road here We've got the manual paddles here which are lovely carbon fibre paddles you turn it in the front end grip is just unreal and because this is X drive it's just unreal it teleports it doesn't accelerate out of tight corners and hairpins it teleports out of them it literally takes you from A to B it doesn't feel like there's anything in between it's so so fast this engine is blisteringly fast I have talked about the S58 struggling with lack of low down torque you see if you're below about two and a half thousand rpm and on a slight incline like we are now I put my foot on the floor and actually nothing's really happening 44 45 46 47 48 slowly starting to pick up now as the turbo starts to spool but it's hardly a rocket ship down there and in fact the engine that this is based on the b58 
deals with those situations a lot better, has a lot more low down torque, a lot more usable low down torque. And therefore cars like the M340i actually make for a better daily most of the time and therefore are a lot more efficient as well because they seem to work a lot less hard uh, to throw you down the road. Remember, this is circa 1800 kilos, so it's, it's no lightweight. Um, and it really does rely on that torque, which does come, but a lot higher up the rev range. And when it comes in, along with that power, once again, it's an absolute rocket ship. It really is. And it still surprises me today, even when I get out of very fast cars, when that torque and when that power delivered, it really does push you back in the seat. And it's phenomenal how quick this car goes down the road. In terms of my preferred preset M buttons, well, my M1 is set up to have the engine in sport, so basically a throttle response and the exhaust note in the medium setting. Chassis is in comfort because I live in the UK and our roads tend to be pretty bad and I think comfort is certainly stiff enough to support this car even when you're pushing on, but obviously just about supple enough to give you a reasonable ride quality. It's not amazing, it's nowhere near the air suspension setup on the RS6 that I'm currently running, but it's certainly a lot better than the previous shape F80 M3 was on a UK road. Uh, steering in comfort because in sport you just lose every single bit of feel that is there and there's not much. Brakes are in sport because they give you a bit more assistance and also a bit more feel. So unlike the steering, you need the brakes in sport and the steering in comfort in my opinion. We have uh, four wheel drive sport so it sends I think it's about 75 or 80 percent power and torque to the rear axle but about 25 percent to the front axle so you've got that all year round all weather grip but you've also got that bmw dna makes this car feel like it's predominantly rear wheel drive uh, and all of the traction control settings switch off because when you're in four wheel drive even on a really greasy wintry uk day this car just has so much grip, it's unbelievable, except for obviously icy and snowy conditions, which then comes down to the tire. And like I've said many times in the channel, you need winter tires when those conditions get bad. Forget about your X-Drive systems or your Quattro systems. Um, you need to slow down and you need to have handling in your car. And the only way you're gonna get that is by putting winter tires on, not by driving around with a four wheel drive system. And my M2 button, well, that's essentially the same settings, except I decouple the front axle and turn this car back to a rear wheel drive only machine with all the traction switched off. You might be wondering, why would you do that? Well, if you followed my adventures through Europe when I got this car up to the Alps and it was beautiful, dry, sunny weather, I actually missed some of the playfulness of the rear wheel drive only version. And it's lovely that you can just switch over <laughs> and basically turn this X-Drive car into a rear wheel drive only version. And that just makes the rear end a little bit more lively. And especially this time of year, you've just got to think twice about putting your foot down because as I'll demonstrate here, if we do a first gear acceleration from here, it will probably. Well, I didn't lift my foot then, my phone went flying first gear once it got above about three and a half four thousand rpm it then spun up the rears as soon as i pulled second it found grip and we were gone and that just shows you how good that rear axle setup is whatever bmw have done with the limit slip diff or the m diff i think they call it those super wide 285 section uh, tires it's just unreal magical amounts of grip and that kind of demonstrated that you very rarely need that X-Drive system, but it is nice to have um, when things get wet and things get cold because it just gives this car a certain amount of sure-footedness that maybe the rear-wheel drive version didn't have. Mm -hmm. 
Ironically, the mode that I spend most of my time driving this car in is the default mode. So everything not back into efficient and comfort, it just does such a good job at being a daily. Where it doesn't do such a great job is when that low down torque catches the car out. So for instance, if you're on an A or B road at 50, 60 miles an hour or motorway, and you want to increase speed slightly, if it's in seventh or eighth gear, like it is in seventh now, if I want to increase speed and I add 10% throttle, it changes down three gears there <laughs> to give me that extra base, even though I'm in efficient engine mode and the gearbox is not right back. It does overreact because it simply doesn't have that torque to give you um, like the B58 would or a 30D or 35D in a BMW lineup. So that's the only time that you really sort of notice that it does have that proper M DNA and the engine, although it's brilliant when you're pushing it and you're singing it right out, really does struggle sometimes when you're just using it as a normal car, especially if fully loaded with two or three other passengers and some luggage in the boot, it's heavier essentially. Then once again, that low down lack of torque really is highlighted. What should I expect from the Touring? I haven't driven one quite yet, but I'm just about to. And I don't think it's gonna blow my mind because, well, it's essentially this car with a bit more weight and a higher center of gravity. So therefore, it will be like this, but not quite as good. And that's kind of a fact. I know BMW M have claimed that it's gonna basically be identical to this car and you're gonna feel very little differences, but the fact that it weighs 80 odd kilos more and the fact that it doesn't have a carbon roof and therefore its center of gravity is higher, it just couldn't physically drive as well as this car. And I am a little bit worried because when I have driven the convertible G83, well, that's about, I think off memory, 250 kilos heavier than this car. And you can feel that the performance has blunted. You notice that lack of low down torque even more. In fact, the S58 feels less powerful in that car because it's a lot heavier. So you're gonna get some of that bluntness on the Touring because naturally it's heavier. Um, so I'm looking very much forward to trying the Touring and I hope that it can prove me wrong, but it's definitely not going to prove me completely wrong because, as I said, physics, the extra weight, the higher center of gravity. Um, but I'm just looking forward to seeing a few on the road, seeing mine on the road, walking up to mine in the morning and the practicalities that come along with a Touring. You know, there's just nothing better in my opinion. I'm gonna get back into mountain biking this year and having a touring to throw my enduro mountain bike in is just gonna be absolutely epic. Guys, thanks a lot for watching. As always, I hope you enjoyed this final drive video on my M3 Competition X Drive. I'm certainly going to miss this car. It's been a brilliant, brilliant car to live with. And uh, yeah, I'm sure the next owner is going to love it just as much. <laughs>